Um, how would you define the Canadian acting style now? Or do you think there is? Is there a Canadian acting style now? Oh, a Canadian, no. A Canadian acting style, how is that different from an American acting style? Except that the Americans do it with more guts. A Canadian acting style? What, a, a, a style for Canadian plays? An acting style for Canadian plays? Um, it depends on, on who. If you're doing more Spanish to somebody, um, I, I think it's, it's language oriented. I think it's clear. I think we speak, we tend to speak clearly in that kind of play. Uh, no, I, I don't, I don't know how you would, Sorry. I don't, I have no idea, I have no idea. Just, just not, it, there, there's Canadian. It's not, not American, it's not British, it's not da da da, it's whatever, everything else is not, that's us. <laughs> um, and what would you say to a student, uh, a young student coming to Ryerson, and you're not gonna be able to teach them, but they said, uh, Mr. Wild, uh, I, I hear that you have some good advice for how I can grow as an artist. What would you say to that? Well, the first thing I think, the first thing would be read, read, read as much as you can, because kids come to us now with virtually no culture. They don't know any literature. They scarcely know their own language. Uh, so I would say get hold of the two volumes of the Norton Anthology of English Literature and read in them completely at random. Pick out things that interest you, pick out things that, and each, each excerpt has an introduction telling you about that person, about their, the, the author and so on. Just read and read and read and develop a hunger for more of that stuff until you know until you have some background that you can relate these various plays to. You can relate your own life to. People have lived before you and they have thought about living before you. And they tell good stories and the stories may have some things that will strike a note for you. Read. That's the very first thing. <laughs> Get yourself an education. I can't now any longer begin work on a period study without, and this is a pure measure of self-defense, administering a two or three week intensive course in English as a second language for Canadians because they do not have language. They never thought about language as an entity, as a tool, as a concept. That's right. It's all the little texty, pushy, thummy things. They don't know how to formulate a simple declarative English sentence. They don't know anything about the parts of speech and how they put together. And we're about to tackle some very interesting, often difficult language, often in verse. And they don't know a participle from a preposition. Yep. You're asking the driver a Porsche and they yeah. don't really know which end the engine is in and, and they don't know where it, the It's not allowed to teach these things now any longer in school. Education's been banned from school because education is an insult. 
To teach them something is to assume that there are things they don't know, and that will undermine their sense of self-esteem. I want to ask you about Stratford. You were there in the last year of the tent? Oh, yeah. What was it like? It was, it was a, another world. It was just absolutely an adventure. It was so marvelous, such fun. Two plays, two months. That was the festival. That's what a festival was. What plays were you in? Uh, Henry V and Mary Wives of Windsor. And what was it like acting in the tent? It was, it was extraordinary. It was just delightful. Um, what it did was, it sound like? Hmm? What did it sound like in the tent? Muffled? No. No, it didn't. We had to stop the performances when it rained because the rain drummed on the roof and you could not hear a thing. There was one time when that happened, we had to stop a performance of Mary Wives of Windsor right in the middle because the, 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 the rains came down and beat upon that place and it was just thunderous. And we had to wait, everyone knew, and then eventually it went off as quickly as it came, as it often does. And uh, I remember Douglas Campbell then came out from underneath the inner stage there with all of Tanya's pillars in there. He simply came out, looked out, put his hand out from outside the, the roof of the thing and got his first laugh and the play went on again. Yeah. It was wonderful. It could be very, very, very hot. And some of us were playing um, um, French soldiers and English soldiers and monks and underdressed. A, a French soldier and then the English soldier with the big heavy male and then over that, the big monk thing. And you come out on a sweltering summer day dressed in three costumes which you were have to peel off. It was appalling. Uh, and in, in a desperate attempt to air condition the place, um, they would bring in massive chunks of ice and place them in the chamber beneath the, the main stage where, where you, you go to, you go down to the vomitories and you go out into this room underneath the stage. And they would place them there and then they would train fans on them to blow the cold air over the ice up into the vomitory and up, they hoped, out into the, into the auditorium. It never really got past the, the, the hook in the, in the vom where you have to make a turn. But we would all stand down there as long as we could waiting before we had to go up on the stage. And what were the audiences like? Oh, fabulous. They were, they were so, uh, they were all taking part in this adventure. They loved it. Um, they were very appreciative. Uh, they were, they felt very intimately connected with the whole thing. It was only on the one, the ground floor. There was no balcony, of course. Or anything.